They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews and deserve to be called Naval Legends. In this episode, Kid, a pirate's tour of duty. My name is Tim Nesmith. I'm the ship superintendent for the USS Kidd, uh, DD-661. The Kidd is a Fletcher-class destroyer that served in World War II from 1943 to 1946. Uh, she served again during the Korean War, uh, starting in 1951, and ended her service in 1964 during the Cold War. The ship derives her name from Rear Admiral Isaac C. Kidd, who died on the bridge of the USS Arizona flagship during the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Arizona sank after her magazines were directly hit by a bomb from the air. Posthumously, Kidd was awarded with the Medal of Honor, the highest U.S. military honor. After the vessel was built, the crew decided to choose a lucky talisman and decided upon the namesake pirate Captain William Kidd, an English sailor who lived in the 17th century who is widely known in folklore. He is even considered to be one of the direct inspirations for Captain Flint from the novel Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, Mrs. Kidd thought that was a great idea and got permission for them to fly the pirate flag and also to paint a pirate up on the forward smokestack. Admiral Kidd's nickname, as it turns out, uh, part of the reason that this actually worked and the Navy gave permission, was Cap after Captain Kidd the pirate. Initially, the ship served in the Atlantic, protecting convoys. Then she was included in the 48th Destroyer Squadron and transferred to the Pacific. Consequently, she participated in the battles of Bougainville, Rebal, Philippines, Tenyan, Guam, and Okinawa. Width, 12 meters. Length, 115 meters. Gross displacement, up to 3,000 tons. Draft, 4 meters. Armament, major caliber, five turrets with 127 millimeter MK-12 versatile cannons, low caliber AA guns, five chained Bofors auto cannons, 40 millimeter and seven 20 millimeter Ehrlich corn, torpedo tubes, a couple of five tube launchers, anti-submarine weapons, key gun howitzers with 28D bombs, hull armor up to 19 millimeters, Propulsion, 60,000 SHP, with speed up to 38 knots, and range of 6,500 NMI. People of a certain age could uh, be pulled into military service, came from all walks of life. Uh, they might have entered the Navy without any particular skill. Uh, they were trained in boot camp, or they, uh, once they got on board ship, there was a phrase called striking a rate. There's 330 people coming from all walks of life, a lot of people, different religions, different ethnicities, three that had different cultural backgrounds thrown into the mix in a small little ship. It was an interesting time for a lot of them. A major part of World War II she spent in hot, moist climates. The crew had a really hard time facing temperatures up to 35 to 40 degrees Celsius and even hotter inside the hull. At the beginning of World War II, five weeks after Pearl Harbor, at 17 years old, I joined the Navy. I went through training center in San Diego and wound up in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on the salvage crew, salvaging the sunken ships that were sunk during the Jap attack on December the 7th, 1941. I worked for 60 days without stopping, 10 to 12 hours a day, cleaning up, removing ammunition, standing by while they picked up bodies and never did let us young boys fool with the bodies, thankfully.
Destroyers those days really lacked internal space. The placement of living space was predominantly ruled by ship's design and convenience was secondary. Enlisted crew slept on top of the magazines. If they took a hit there and there's an explosion, unfortunately, you would lose those crew members. And for that reason, the crew did not sleep segregated according to their division. All the engineers wouldn't be in one spot. All the gunners wouldn't be in another spot. You would have them scattered throughout the ship so that if you did take a hit like that, uh, you wouldn't lose a large percentage of one area. The U.S. fleet has always longed to maximize survivability of its vessels. All expedient equipment was designed in order to help the crew to repair any damage possible. For instance, the crew's hammocks were made water and fireproof. These could easily be used to plug modest-sized holes in the ship and stamp out a fire. We are in Radio Central here aboard the Kid. During the Kamikaze attack in 1945, this area was hit pretty hard by the bomb blast. It shredded the entire uh, port side bulkhead. Uh, a lot of the wounded uh, from that attack came from this area. The situation in the Pacific became quite heated by the end of the 1930s. Japan had invaded China and was preparing to advance towards the U.S. Moreover, the Japanese fleet grew very rapidly. The threat didn't remain unnoticed from over the ocean. The U.S. military machine developed classes of ships, one after another, gradually improving their characteristics. Of all the ships in the Navy, the battle wagons get all the attention and the aircraft carriers all the glory, but arguably the backbone of the fleet has always been the destroyers. Small, fast, nimble little ships with dual-purpose armament, which can often pack a punch quite above their weight. One of the most numerous classes was the Fletcher-class destroyer. 175 or so were built, and we are on one right now, USS Kidd, which is pretty much 1945 configuration as it was at the end of the war. Work on Fletcher-class ships was initiated in 1939, right before World War II broke out. They turned out to be larger than their predecessors, allowing for an increase in their battle potential. A number of additional measures were introduced so as to increase sustainability. The deck's armor was up to 19 millimeters thick. The engine and boiler rooms were placed far away from each other. Such an arrangement lowered the chances of the ship's immobilization, even if heavily damaged. Fletchers turned out to be outstandingly robust, withstanding multiple successful assaults, a fact that really lifted the spirits of the crews on board. Major caliber cannons were designed to engage both aerial and ground targets. The shells were equipped with remote fuses that significantly increased the power of the ship's artillery fire. Armed with a good selection of weaponry, from dual-purpose 5-inch guns down to anti-ship torpedoes and anti-submarine depth charges, a destroyer had a fair chance of being a danger to pretty much anything that it met on the high seas. Despite the high battle potential, Fletchers were never designed for solo operations. As a rule, they were used in squadrons, similar to any other destroyers. Destroyers would be in divisions of three and four squadrons of eight and nine. Their usual taskings were escort duty, anti-submarine warfare, picket ships, reconnaissance, screening, and pretty much anything that a ship could do, a destroyer could be asked to do it. Based on their powerful armament, unique survivability, sophisticated fire control systems, long operational range, and decent seakeeping, Fletchers are rightfully considered one of the best ships of this type. Of course, along with many other classes of ships, they also had their fair share of casualties during the war. There were 25 Fletcher-class destroyers that were sunk during World War II. Japanese kamikaze tactics became their major headache. The ships were quite an easy target, patrolling far away from major forces. And it was April 1945 that our Pacific pirate first encountered kamikaze pilots. Kidd was patrolling in a group of four destroyers when a couple of aircraft were spotted in the skies, seemingly having a dogfight with one another. Perplexed to have detected an Allied plane, the ships ceased fire and kept observing. Only when the couple started to descend, the crews realized that it was a trap set by a kamikaze. 
One of the planes was shot down, but the other one hit the USS Kidd's deck. Almost a third of the crew was incapacitated, 38 killed, 45 wounded. The chief mechanic was boiled alive in the ship's boiler rooms. The ship's doctor was caught by a bomb fragment and lost his eye, making him unable to fulfill his duty. He was carrying a camera that he used to shoot the battle. After the explosion, its film was mostly burned, except for the fragment displaying the kamikaze plane directly before the impact. The young boy and all the young boys were put in the most dangerous, dirtiest jobs. Oh, on my ship, I was in the powder magazine. I had no idea it was going to be hit. I don't know what happened, but all I know is a bang. The lights went out. I went out. I woke up. Couldn't see anything because it was so dark. Despite all these casualties, the kid managed to move away for repairs under her own steam. This surely outlines the outstanding construction of Fletcher's and the high skill of the crews aboard. However, this was the end of World War II for the USS Kidd. Later, she would participate in the Korean War, supporting ground force with her cannons. During her service years, the USS Kidd was awarded with 12 battle stars, eight during World War II, and the rest in the Korean events. The ship also participated in numerous landing operations across the Pacific Ocean Islands, repelled aerial attacks of the Japanese, and even scored a film role in Run Silent, Run Deep, a movie dedicated to U.S. submarines. In 1964, after 20 years of service, the destroyer, now inferior in certain parameters, was finally decommissioned. Nevertheless, a lucky fate saved the pirate ship from the dock cutters, as it was decided to leave her among three Fletchers set to be renovated and turned into floating museums. She's been brought here to Baton Rouge uh, as a memorial for the state's veterans and for destroyer and Navy veterans all around the country uh, and is rated one of the most accurate historical ships in the historic fleet which spans about five continents. The name USS Kidd now belongs to the new Arley Burke class of ship. This old pirate may now sleep well. Her flag is in reliable hands.